Hey everybody, welcome to Ask an Austrian, episode three. I am Bob Murphy, and I am pleased to field some of these questions. And just to warn you, there is a mini-me off-camera who may wake up at any moment, but let me see if I can get this in before the situation intensifies. So Art Carlson asks, GDP includes government spending. MV, therefore, includes what government spends. Does M include Fed infusions? If we were to use M as only funds issued by the Treasury and take government out of V, can we compare it to normal MV to show how government increases P? Okay, so what Art is referring to is the famous equation of exchange that MV equals P times Q. So there's a lot going on in that equation. Uh, what I'm going to do here is try to give enough information that Art can answer his own question, as it were, because it's, it's a little bit subtle here. Um, so first of all, the M always includes all the t types of money. Like, so you, you would never, um, only include certain types of M. I mean, partly cause money's fungible. Like, so that this would be really conceptually tricky. However, in art's defense, let me just point out one subtlety of what actually happens. So in the big picture, and in, in originally the equation used to be, MV equals P times T, where T stood for all transactions. And so if you're thinking if M is all the pieces of money and V is the velocity of circulation, which means like on average, how many times does each dollar bill, let's say if we're talking about the U.S., change hands in, let's say, a year, then M times V, where M is the number of dollars, and V is how many times does a dollar change hand on average per year, that gives total spending. And then P times T, P is the price level, T is um, the number of transactions. So P times T, and, and P meaning price level, meaning the average price per transaction, is also measuring total spending. So that's why it's a tautology. That's why it's necessarily true. And then the idea is, oh, so like if M goes up, then you know that MV is higher, other things equal. So then does P go up? So in that original framework where it's obvious, notice that those transactions include all transactions, including like people buying stock. Okay. But yet that's not how people normally use it. They want to use it to focus on real GDP. So in practice, what they do is they say, Oh, like the, on the left hand side, the V only includes how many times does a dollar bill change hands in a transaction involving newly produced goods and services. Cause keep in mind, like if I go and buy a used car, that's not part of real GDP because it's not newly produced. Okay, so it, it is the way this thing is used in practice. It does get pretty arbitrary moving away from the sort of common sense. Oh, this is just, you know, accounting. This is real simple stuff. No, the way economists in practice use it, it very quickly moves away from just, just counting up numbers here. You know, no, we're not imposing any ideology or any framework or any theory on this that you already, if you're trying to use it to talk about real GDP, are excluding arguably most transactions all right so what art's getting at is he's saying if we um could, could you isolate how much government's increasing p i mean I, I guess so but i don't think you're adding anything more than just saying oh if if the fed increases the money stock then that's gonna make prices go higher you know what i mean like I, I don't think you're adding any any more sophistication than that so um, so, so yes, but I don't know that using the MV equals PT framework is, is adding much to it, unless just implicitly the idea that, oh, other things equal, the more money there is, higher prices will be. Okay, um, Michael Lewis says, My understanding is that most of the complaints libertarians have with the state boils down to a lack of consent, but theoretically we could dissolve all governments tomorrow and a group of people could voluntarily enter into a contract that looks identical to the current United States government. Da, 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 da. Okay, and so he's wondering, like, you know, wouldn't libertarians still have a problem with that? So here, this is a good question. I was really grappling with this stuff back, like in the period when I wrote Chaos Theory. Um, so what I would say is, in terms of uh, rights theory, like the NAP and stuff, just strictly speaking, yes, if, a, if somebody owned all the land and said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to recreate the conditions that, prevailed underneath you know the u.s government back in the day and anyone who lives here agrees that that's what they're going to do you could do that and that wouldn't be a rights violation okay just like somebody could set up a 
a hotel and call it Alcatraz and say, everybody who comes here agrees, you know, we're going to go and find historically a particular inmate at Alcatraz that you're going to be. And then we, you know, the people playing the guards get to beat you up and blah, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. And once you come on here and sign this contract, you can never leave because from now on you're a convicted murderer. Remember? Wink, wink. You could do that. And libertarians differ, but there's certainly a strain in libertarianism that would say, yes, technically you would have the ability to do that. And that would be consistent with libertarianism. So I would just say, I think that's probably not going to happen, right? Empirically. And likewise with the U.S. government thing, the reason these so-called crazy things happen uh, is because when people take over control of the U.S. federal government, they're actually not the owners of the country. And that's, that's an important point to make here. Okay, so let me just, I know I'm saying a lot of stuff real fast here, trying to squeeze things in, but let me just say that again to be sure you guys catch it. It is not true that when people like win an election, like let's say the Democrats win in 2020, it's not true or it's not correct to view it as the Democratic Party or the Biden administration or whatever, or Biden and his buddies temporarily become owners of the country. That's not the way to look at it. They become people who have control of the resources temporarily. So they're, if you want to say caretakers, or maybe that's a misleading term because they're not taking care, but it's a fundamental difference, right? It's just like the difference between if, if uh, you know, looters get an access to a store for 24 hours or something. Like that's not the same as the ownership, okay? And and again, I'm not I'm not just talking about the ethics involved. I mean, just the way you would treat the resources in question. And this is why, by the way, Hans Hoppe thinks that yes, anarcho-capitalism or the natural order is the best of all regimes or arrangements, social uh, structures. But he thinks moder- hereditary monarchy is way way better than mass democracy where there's periodic elections because under a hereditary monarchy, the king is going to pick policies knowing that after I'm, you know, I'll be in power for decades or to one of, you know, somebody poisons me or whatever, and then my heirs will take it over. And so you're going to make far sighted decisions with the, you know, with, with those sorts of things in mind. So you're not going to have confiscatory marginal income tax rates. Why would you do that? Yeah. You might get a, a bunch of revenue in the next, five years, but at the cost of the long, long-term economic development. Whereas if you're a king and you're thinking in terms of decades, at least, then you're not going to have 70% marginal income tax rates. Why would you do that? that that's not going to, you know, just like a corporation wouldn't charge a billion dollars for, you know, or, you know, like a, like a movie theater wouldn't charge $30 for a bag of popcorn or something. Right, even if they thought, oh no, the people who are in here right now, they some of them might pay it. Well, no, because that's going to hurt your long term business prospects. Okay, so keep that stuff in mind as well. That it would not be profitable for someone who, like you know, some real rich person bought the current landmass of the continental United States. It would never be profitable for them to recreate the conditions of the current U.S. government, right? Because the people running the U.S. government right now are not maximizing tax revenue, among other things. So keep that in mind. You might be thinking that, but they're not. All right. So again, the, the the nature of government because people are only temporary, only have temporary control, they don't act the same way as a true owner would. By the way, one last thing on this: even an owner who's only got two years left to live still acts responsibly to maximize the value of the resource because they know in my estate after I die, I want this resource to have its maximum value. Right. So somebody who owned a forest, you know, a private forest, you know, some guy who's 80 years old and, and the doctor tells him he's got two years left to live and he's got a will and everything and he's going to donate money to the Mises Institute. He wouldn't just clear cut the forest because, oh, I got to hurry up and use this resource before I die. Well, no, because if that's not the correct thing to do to maximize the present discounted value of that resource, he wouldn't do that because passing on the forest into his estate with, you know, just slowly cutting it down the ways that's optimal in terms of, you know, economics, that's still the correct thing to do, even if you personally are about to die, all right? Um, Eduardo Diaz says, should there be government mask mandates to fight COVID-19? Should we let property owners, blah, 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 decide what rules to serve customers? 
Great question. I'm going to actually, I think, write something on this pretty soon um, for Mises.org. So, no, there shouldn't be government mask mandates. I don't think at all. I mean, that's just a standard violation of property rights. And besides that, even if you think that, you know, uh, novel coronavirus and COVID-19 are a really serious public health menace, you should still oppose lockdowns and mask mandates, political ones, that that actually makes it harder to contain. Like right now, because I personally, um, for various reasons, because like, Someone in my household, for example, has lung issues, and so we've been very vigilant about wearing masks, and, and I'm talking N95s from the beginning, like back before wearing masks was cool, back when the CDC was telling Americans don't wear masks, we were wearing, wearing masks, right? And so I get into arguments with libertarians about this stuff, that there's a lot of memes getting shared that I think are not quite right, but my point is, even though I think COVID-19 is a bigger deal than a lot of libertarians do, you know, who like might use the word hoax or something. I'm all the more so opposed to the lockdowns because when I challenge libertarians, they quickly fall back on, well, you know, these mandates are crazy, right? And so that's kind of the point that yes, when the government tries to force something, it causes a backlash. So people right now proudly say, ha I went to the store and didn't wear a mask because they're thinking this was, this is coercively being rammed down our throats. And so I'm a hero by thumbing my nose at the system. Whereas if it were voluntary, if the government just, you know, put out health information and said, we're going to let stores make their own decisions, you know, buyer beware. And then individual storekeepers could look at the evidence and say, okay, I'm going to have policies or not. Then if somebody said, oh, I, I went in there and lied about this pre-existing condition because I didn't want to wear a mask. They'd be like, okay, so you're just not doing what the store owner wants on his property just because you don't feel like putting on a mask. That's not cool. Right. So, so that's what I'm saying that the, the the social customs or the mores would be flipped. And beyond that, though, in a world where it really was left up to each individual establishment what rules to have, in a large city, presumably at least some of the establishments would say, hey, at this place, you got to have a mask on to come in, whereas other places wouldn't have that policy. And so the population would self-sort. So the people who didn't think COVID-19 was a big deal or who thought, oh, yeah, it's a big deal if you're in a nursing home or something, but I'm young and healthy, what do I care? They would go to the stores where you don't have to wear masks. And the people who were vulnerable or who like had somebody at home that they really wanted to make sure they didn't accidentally pass it on to, they would wear their masks and wear them properly. You know, They wouldn't be like these people who just slap something on and their nose isn't covered and things like that. And they would go to the stores that had the policy. So no, that's exactly what you want. You see how that's a much better isolation strategy than right now where it's one size fits all. The government says every establishment has to have a mask policy. So now, no matter where you go shopping, half the people in the store think masks are stupid and they're not really taking it seriously. They're not putting them on properly. And so right now, this is, this is a terrible outcome, even for people like me who I'm being extremely vigilant about making sure I do what I can to not catch the virus because I don't want to accidentally, like I say, pass it on to someone in my household. So I would much rather there be non-coercive rules in place so that we could go to the one store in town, for example, that you know has a strict mask policy because I would know the other people in the, that store with me shopping are all taking it very seriously and their masks are going to fit properly and blah, blah, blah. All right. Um, Paul Braco. In a voluntary society, how could nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons be handled in a way that doesn't require a state, but also would stop deranged individuals from using them on peaceful people? Okay, so I handled this specifically in my pamphlet, Chaos Theory. So if you Google Bob Murphy Chaos Theory, it should, it should pop up as a PDF. Um, real quickly, the standard, some of the standard like NAP-type arguments, taken to their logical extreme, it would mean that, oh, yeah, in other words, like if you're going to oppose gun control on the grounds that, hey, until I actually, you know, violate somebody's rights, nobody can tell me that I can't have an AR-15 or what. Strictly speaking, that argument would mean, oh, in a free society, my next door neighbor can have, uh, you know, 15 nuclear warheads in his basement. And I don't think most of us agree with it. And until he takes out a city... You know, we the law can't do anything. That seems crazy, right? And so don't worry. We, we aren't forced into making that choice. That with private property and, you know, real estate is owned by people and they can set whatever rules they want. 
it could be that oh, like a, a a real estate developer who's developing a bunch, you know, a community with a bunch of homes. Part of what you're agreeing to when you buy a house in that tract is not only are you not going to play obnoxious music at 2 a.m. as a condition of buying into this community, but you're also agreeing you're not going to have deadly nerve gas stockpiled in your basement, right? So that's to me the way you would handle it. And then I elaborate more in, like I said, my book Chaos Theory. So none of that justifies government coming in and saying, oh, we're going to have common sense gun control because they, they don't, you know, they're not the rightful owners of the U.S. for one thing, but also, um, you know, there the slippery slope really is in place. So given those policies, you wouldn't need to worry about a slippery slope just because a, a person developing a residential community, there would be standard rules like you can't have biological weapons in your basement. They wouldn't, it wouldn't just naturally follow them up. Oh, if we let that in the door, then three years from now, every new house that's built, the owner is going to be agreeing as one of the clauses. You can't have a, a, a shotgun for self-defense from a home invader. That wouldn't follow, right? Because that wouldn't be profitable, right? There's, you're not going to be losing business because nobody's going to buy a house if they're not allowed to have chemical weapons in their basement. Whereas there will be a lot of people who will say, no, I actually want to have the ability, the option to have a shotgun at home for self-defense. So I'm not going to buy into this neighborhood if that's one of the conditions, right? So you see how that works. So again, it's when there's genuine private property, you let owners set what the policies they want. And again, that includes the developer who wants to maximize the value of the community. And so, you know, if, if certain rules would make the neighborhood as a whole have higher property values, even by restricting the freedoms of any individual buyer, maybe that's what the developer will do. And like again, forget gun control, forget, you know, simple things like not having crazy loud parties at 2 a.m. You know, some people wouldn't want to buy into a neighborhood if every homeowner has the right to have crazy parties at 2 a.m. Some places might want that, right? So again, it's it's freedom, you know, let, let people pick whatever rules they want. But I'm saying you don't have to worry about some of these absurd outcomes or slippery slopes because that's what the profit and loss mechanism guards against. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Andrew Riley says, is there any moral limit on free trade? Is there any point at which another country or trading partner violates libertarian principles so egregiously that you cut off relations? Or is there no line at all? Buying oil from ISIS is fine, coal from DPRK, Mercedes cars from the Nazis, da 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 da, da. Okay. So here, I'm not going to give you the definitive answer because I think it would be up to the legal system, but here's just the framework. So the way I think that, you know, you got a free society. So there's no government entity that's looking around saying, hey, are we going to allow trade of our people with that regime over there? That there would be no such agency. However, it could be that if you are directly dealing in commercial, tra certain commercial transactions with known criminals, that you might yourself thereby be participating in criminal activity. All right. So. A mob boss, for example, that hires hitmen and says, here, here's $100,000, go murder this person next Thursday, this rival mob boss. I don't think you would argue, hey, that's just free trade. You know, it's not illegal to give someone $100,000. I didn't do anything. Or, yeah, prosecute the shooter. What he did when he shot that mob boss in the head, he committed a crime. And so the libertarian law system should go after him. But the person who hired him to do it, I didn't break any rules, right? I'm allowed to give $100,000 to somebody. I, I, there are some libertarians who would argue that, by the way, but I think, and I think Stefan Kinsella agrees with me, that that's goofy, right? That they're, you know, hiring someone to commit a crime is, is, is itself criminal, okay? But, and, and by the way, so that's one of the reasons I think it's dangerous. You can't just sit in your armchair and use the NIP to derive the entire body of libertarian law. I, I think that that's a mistaken enterprise and that the legal system and its rules does emerge or should emerge spontaneously as an accumulation of private judicial decisions rendered by private judges who were hired by willing plaintiffs and defendants in particular cases. So if you haven't seen me give my lecture on this, you should check it out. Um, it's on YouTube. It's Robert Murphy, The Market for Security. It's this talk that I give at the Mises Institute a lot at Mises U. And just go look at it and you'll see more of the framework. But, but, but I, sorry, so to answer Andrew's question, um, I, 
if there's just some diner and mob guys come in and they order steak and eggs every Thursday, I don't think the legal system would say that the diner is engaging in criminal activity. Whereas, you know, so, somebody who goes, a jewel thief who goes and steals diamonds from a jewelry store and then fences them, the fence knowing full well that he's paying money for, you know, stolen goods and then reselling them is, to my mind, is participating in criminal activity. And I could see that person being, um, you know, certain parties being able to, to bring suit against it. Th- that Maybe that's one way, Andrew, of looking at it, is who is it out there who is the victim of a crime that is going to try to prosecute the the person engaging in free trade with, you know, criminal regimes, All right? So if the way it might work is if, yeah, if, if North Korea uses slave labor and they're sending really cheap exports and somebody in Ancapistan is importing them, there could be groups, philanthropic groups, victims advocacy groups that on behalf of the slaves bring suit against some of the consumers and maybe that could work and maybe there'd be some way to do it. But you see, that I think that's the route it would have to take. It would not be that, oh, there's this entity that's looking around saying, oh, we got to have tariffs or we're going to forbid trade. with that. That's not the way it would work. There would be no such entity. Okay. Um, da, da, da. Jonathan Gress writes, says, a lot of people are bullish about the current economy, including many libertarians. Are they right or are there reasons to anticipate another crash soon? Um, here I'm going to be wishy-washy. So I, for a while, was predicting a bad crash from the various rounds of QE that the Fed had blown up, you know, in the Bernanke regime. And as of last summer, so summer of 2019, when the yield curve inverted, I was saying there's going to be a really bad recession by next summer, meaning by summer of 2020. So I was right, right? There really was a bad crash and unemployment went through the roof. But of course, that coincided with the lockdowns and COVID-19 and all that stuff. So it's hard to say, was I actually vindicated or did I get lucky? All right, so there's that element that's really tricky that's kind of screwing everything up. And now the Fed has done even yet again unprecedented monetary expansion in response to the crisis. Well, when I say in response to crisis, I don't mean that what the Fed's doing is because Powell's sitting around saying, oh, this is the right thing to do in a pandemic. I think they're just doing what they can get away with that benefits their buddies. But um, so I'm saying in terms of standard Austrian theory, what they're doing is setting us up for an even worse crash. But right now, technically, I think we're now in the expansionary phase. So it's a little bit tricky to figure out where are we. So even if you thought Austrian business cycle theory is great and is the key to understanding what's going on. And I do think that it's hard to know at this point, where are we in the cycle? Because that the crazy lockdowns were superimposed on top of this. And so it's, it's, you know, it's hard for me to say, is there going to be another crash two months from now? That's still the remnants of that, you know, the QE bubbles that Bernanke blew up or are we now past that? And we're now in a false recovery spawned by what, Powell's doing and it's I'm not exactly sure yet because again it, if it weren't for the coronavirus and the lockdowns I would be in a much more confident position to to say but right now it's hard to figure out where are we in the standard cycle because this other thing was just dropped right on top of it so this way no matter what happens I'm going to say see I told you so okay what do we got here we've got just a few more minutes you can perhaps hear some gurgling but I think we can get through without catastrophe here uh, Joshua Byer says, assuming it doesn't, why does protectionism not benefit the protected nation's industrial base? Okay, well, you're kind of assu- um, anticipating the possible response. I could certainly imagine a scenario where high tariff barriers promote the development of, you know, I guess you mean like manufacturing output, something like that. I could totally imagine that, right? So I'm not saying it would pertain to any country right now in the real world, but we can easily imagine, you know, some island nation, for example, where what their comparative advantage is would be to, uh, I don't know, develop like like financial services, right? Like like let's just you know say there's an island in the middle of nowhere, but they have a lot of smart people there who are good with math. Maybe what they ought to do is just get good internet 
and all they do is financial transact or they just, you know, uh, do software design or something, things like that, that because it's easy to export over satellites. It's cheap, whereas shipping cars is not a great use of, you know, their resources and, you know, getting in the steel and whatever, you know, maybe that's true or because land is so scarce that maybe having factories to make the cars there is a stupid use of their limited real estate. Maybe it makes more sense to bring the car. I'm, I'm just saying you could easily imagine something like that. Like maybe if Manhattan seceded from the rest of the country and became its own little country, I think it would be probably dumb to expect the Island of Manhattan to produce all the cars and buses and stuff that it, it used, that its people used, right? I think it would make more sense for it to specialize in financial services and then use those exports to pay for importing already made buses and cars. But if that's what's supposed to be, and then the government of Manhattan instead had really high tariff barriers that could artificially uh, create a, a domestic industrial base where they make their own cars and buses, yeah, that could happen. It would, it would still be dumb, though. So I don't, I'm, I don't know if that's answering your question, Joshua. Uh, let's see. Jim Higginbottom says, if there's no intellectual property laws, why would pharmaceutical companies do expensive research and development? Well, here again is another example where it's hard to peel back state interventions just piecemeal. That if you go full bore, you know, ANCAP, it's much easier to see how, oh, that's clearly going to be a better outcome, both ethically and practically than the current system. Whereas if you have all the other regulations in place and just peel back one thing, that might really be bad or lead to certain really bad consequences. So that's example here. The reason pharmaceutical companies right now need to spend a billion, and that's billion with a B as in boy, dollars plus to bring a new drug to market is because of the FDA, right? And all the ridiculous hoops you got to jump through to prove safety and efficacy, and then they don't even do that, obviously, um, with a new with a new product. So the only reason you think, oh, we need IP, otherwise no new drugs would be brought to market, is because of the FDA. If you got rid of the FDA, then there would be enough incentive to develop new stuff. And also, too, um, it would look different, don't get me wrong, but it's not that it would grind to us a halt. Just like if you got rid of IP in music, the type of music that would be produced would be different, but arguably be better. There'd be a lot more, you know, new bands coming who would put their stuff out for free on YouTube or whatever to try to build up an audience. And then they would have performances and things like that. And, you know, go do live shows and try to sell CDs on the spot and things like that, or, you know, other sort of memorabilia. And that's how they would market themselves as opposed to artists that are picked by big corporations to do stuff in the studio and then they mass produce it and you can't copy it because you get prosecuted. Right. So that's the model it is right now. So it's not that music would stop being produced with no IP, but it might not look like the current music industry. And I would be surprised if most of you would prefer the output from the current system relative to one with no IP. Okay. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Let's do one more. Adam has a few here. Uh, 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 uh. He says, in a truly free market economy, would we see the ups and downs in the stock market or the market in general that we have been seeing the last 100 plus years? No, absolutely not. Right. So that's the, the quintessential, you know, Mises business cycle theory says that the banking system. So it's not just the Fed, it's a commercial banking system. But of course, with a Fed, this dominates the process injects the market with new credit that's not backed up by genuine savings that pushes interest rates artificially low and that causes an unsustainable boom. And then typically the banks chicken out at some point because of you know inflationary pressures usually. So they stop with the easy credit policy that makes interest rates spike. A bunch of entrepreneurs realize, uh-oh, we expanded too much. Things aren't as good as we thought. And there's a crash. Okay, so... According to Mises, the business cycle is not a feature inherent to the market economy. It's not just like, oh, that's capitalism for you. You know, we have innovation and stuff, but we got to tolerate that every five or six years there's a big recession. No, no, no. That's not a normal feature of capitalism. That's a feature of a system where money and banking have been uh, 
taken over by the state. Okay, so get rid of those interventions and have a genuine free market in money and banking. And Mises thinks you you wouldn't have these wild ups and downs. Individual firms might make mistakes, open up a new store, realize, oops, we were too optimistic. The people in this town, you know, don't don't like this restaurant enough, and they have to close down and lay those people off. But these the layoffs wouldn't come in clusters. That's really the thing that the that the economist has to explain with the theory of the business cycle is. Why is it that these entrepreneurial waves of optimism and then pessimism are clustered as opposed to just being statistically distributed? And, oh, yeah, every once in a while somebody screws up and, you know, they, they are overly optimistic and then they expand and they have to lay off workers. It shouldn't be that unemployment shoots up to 9% every once in a while. Why, does that, why would that happen if it were just, you know, a random thing in terms of people making mistakes? So there's something that systematically causes entrepreneurs to invest too much and then realize, whoa, we made a mistake. And so according to Mises, that has to do with the distortion of interest rates and flooding the market with unbacked credit. So if you got rid of that, then you would, wouldn't see such volatility. Okay, well, I'll wrap up there. Thanks for tuning in, everybody.